but so by a bit more introduction, my name is Jeff Kass. Um, instead of while dispensing as a response to the need to measure biodiversity in a much more uh, sustainable um, and, and cohesive way, I was talking to someone from Amazon who said, look, if we're going to get, um, they, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on carbon credits and the data for carbon credits is pretty mixed, especially outside the UK. If we're going to get better investment from especially the private sector into nature-based recovery, we need better data so that investors can believe in the data. So I looked around and well, hang on, you know, how, do, how do we measure biodiversity? Obviously, there's massive, massive work in academia and professional ecologists. But if this workload is going to markedly increase, then we need something which is more scalable. And there's obviously there's different ways of doing this. There's eDNA and there's drones and all that really good stuff. And they've all absolutely got their place in, in this, this conundrum that we're trying to understand how biodiversity changes. But the one thing that stood out to me was the fact that we need something which was low cost, people can relate to the results, it was scalable and it was auditable. So if you've found a, a rare bird, can you prove that rare bird was actually on site because it may have some significance to the, the site permission or, or the recovery of the site or whatever. And the only thing that really fitted that was was, was sound, was bioacoustics. Um, my background, by the way, I was a, I was a bird ringer. I was a, a technologist. Um, so we set this up, say, two, two and a half years ago, and we trialed it for a year we were on many sites across the UK to see if we could get accurate results when we could scale it both technically and, and, and understand what the cost is of, of providing this. Um, and we set ourselves a goal right at the beginning, something called a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, a BHAG, as it's called. And this was like, if in two years' time, what would be our pinnacle of achievement? And, and for me, we set ourselves a goal of being on Spring Watch. So if we get on Spring Watch, it means we have to have something that works, it's scalable. The researchers from, from the BBC and, and the RSPB believe in the data. Um, so I'm going to touch on that as, as the case study. Uh, and I'm going to show you, show a demo of, of their data as well from that site. It's a, it's a, a six-week project that has some fascinating uh, insights from RSPBR. So um, let me just move on. Um, so, ha so how does it work? Um, we use uh, acoustic recorders. You've seen the ones from, from Wildlife Acoustics already. Um, and and you, have a, you have a site plan, a survey plan. Uh, a methodology. Uh, I think Kate's going to perhaps touch on this a little bit later. Um, where are you going to put the recorders? How are you going to manage the recorders? What frequency? How are you going to sample the data? Um, and quite often you have multiple recorders per site. Some sites we have 20 plus recorders across a big site. Um, you install the sensors. Typically today you have to go and get the SD cards off the, off the devices, um, upload them to our website through a file manager interface. We run the specific machine learning uh, we analyze uh, a file, an hour long file in 30 seconds, um, and it generates lots of records saying in this three second clip, we're 85% certain it was a robin calling. And some sites now we've got 2 million species level records where we've been recording 24 seven for nearly two years. And it's showing unprecedented insights into behaviors like of Chetty's warbler or when species arrive and depart. Um, species distribution, which I'll come on to specifically at ARN because it was quite a fascinating insight there. So it creates all sorts of insights as to what's happening on a site. So more specifically how, how it works um, is um, you have your recorder, as I mentioned. We, we, we need to know the latitude and longitude uh, for reasons that will become apparent. The files get uploaded and of course there's a, there's a sonogram that's generated and, and we analyze it to say at, at the moment, every three seconds, four, three seconds. So we look at every three second clip and matches it against the library. In part, we use things like BirdNet and some other things as well to identify what species may have made a sound. Now, this is where I'm going to start digging into some of the, of the limitations here. Um, there are some, some you know, this is not a, a silver bullet. There are some limitations, which I think both Kate and myself are going to explore. Um, so we generate a record, it said yeah, it was 83% certain it was a robin, or it could be say 83% certain it was uh, an Amazonian mot mot or whatever it, against the library. So once you've got that, that, that uh, identification, we have to then filter it in some way because the first step, the uh, AI has no understanding geographically or a, a very little context as to where this, this, this files come from. So the, the, the standard way of applying filters 
in most of this stuff is, is to use some sort of reference database like eBird to say, at this time of year, this latitude and longitude, has this bird been reported before? And if so, how frequently is it? And that's good because it ex ex excludes all this spurious stuff or most of the spurious stuff but it can also be a significant limitation, especially if you're looking for rare or underreported or cryptic species. Um, if you think about something like woodcock, you know, there's loads of them in the winter, probably get good coverage of reports on eBird or BirdTrack or whatever. But in the summer, um, they, I suspect they're underreported, they're pretty scarce anyway. So I'm gonna come back to filters a little bit later on because choosing the right filters is really important um, for the purpose of the project that you're trying to carry out. Um, if you're looking for rare birds or cryptic birds, um, perhaps use a different approach. Um, but these, these, these process, the, the, these analytics, they generate vast quantities of data. So one of these little recorders in a sort of a, a lowland you know, rural site will, will generate about 200 to 250,000 species level records a year. And when you have multiple records across, the, uh, multiple recorders across the site, you sort of get vast quantities of data. Um, in some ways, this could be a bit daunting. I think, well, are we actually, why should we record or gather so much data? But when we start to get this like level of, of data, we can start to ask very different questions um, at a level which is perhaps unprecedented. Uh, I mean, there are sites now in the Somerset levels, uh, working with the Somerset Wildlife Trust, where we're probably getting 5 million species level records from adjacent sites in the core of the, core of the Avalon marshes. Um, so, you know, I said we're finding species distribution, which is really fascinating, uh, species richness. Um, but what I want to do is just explore a little bit about the, the project we did at uh, for Spring Watch. Uh, so for Spring Watch, uh, it took, I should say, Stephen, by the way, was the original producer for Spring Watch. Is that right, Stephen? And you, you got a BAFTA for it? Uh, eventually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Better late than ever. Um, so we, we courtesy of some of some people like Stephen you asked to approach the the, the um the producer and it took quite a while and of course he had no budget being the BBC it was skint. Um so we agreed in the end we would put six recorders at RSPB on. So RSPB on if for those of you who don't know is on on um Pool Harbour in, in, in Dorset in the south of England. Um it's a fantastic site. It's it's very diverse. Um it's got uh coniferous plantations it's got heathland it's got it's on the harbor so it's it's kind of fresh fresh and brackish water um and we put those six records recorders put in and we, we were there for six weeks we just yeah, every week we'd go and change the, the, the uh, sd cards we were recording 24 7 uh, to get as much data as possible and we had so we had seven thousand hours of audio um now one thing i'd say is you know, when you look at some of the pack bioacoustic deployment guidelines um they talk about sampling every five minutes or five minutes per hour which is perfectly perfectly valid way of doing things um but if you can start to to, to uh, capture more data you're recording say 30 minutes per hour or, or as we did on for a continuous recording we could start to get a lot of much richer data it's typically you're typically constrained by the batteries on the devices and how frequently you're able, available to visit them. Um, and then you obviously have vast amounts of audio to update, so you need good broadband if that's how you want to do it. So we we, we, we got 430,000 species level records from that data of, of varying quality. Um, yeah, pretty much all of them were correct. There was a few examples I'll, I'll go into where we get false positives. Um, false positives and false negatives are a challenge. False positives are far easier to recognize because it was a misidentification. False negatives are much harder because you miss stuff consistently, and starling is, is a good example of that. Or I think we're underreporting starlings, um, and so we've got two levers <clears throat> to pull. One is the is the, the accuracy of each record, saying is it eighty five percent or ninety percent likely to be true, and also how likely is this species to occur on this site. So we we had uh, eighty nine species. And I'll show you the data in a moment. Um, and we found a species they'd never recorded it <clears throat> as on before, which was a um, a wood warbler. I was going to do a spoiler alert. Um, so it, it was covered really well. Chris Packham got very very excited by by what we were doing, um, and you know I think we 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 didn't start recording until I think the end of April, which is a bit bit of a shame. If we'd gone a month early, we'd have got you know the start of the migration season. But do watch it if you, if you can. If you're outside the UK, um, it might be a challenge because I think the BBC limit uh, access to some of their content. But anyway, if, if you need any copy, just, just let me know. So at that point, um, 
uh, uh, this mouse to work. Um, I've got some slides which you can see later on, but I'm going to do a quick demo of how this works in practice. So just bear with me a second. So this is uh, the current version of how people may use the site. This is going through radical change in the very near future. Um, but the way it stands at the moment is, is you have some controls at the top, uh, which, which recorders you want to look at. Uh, um, what's going on here? Why is it not working? It's not working. Oh, there we go. So there's all the different recorders that you, you, you may have on your site, which time periods you're interested in, which species you're interested in. And there's, there's two, two deeper to talk about. The detection confidence, how confident was the AI in recognizing that species? And that's affected by, obviously, the quality of the sound, any background noises that are happening. And we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more. So typically, we would suggest people use a, a detection confidence of about 85%. And as you'll see, as we increase the confidence, the number of records goes down. So you've increased the quality, reduced the quantity. And the other, the other criteria, and this is where filters become really important, is, is how likely is this bird to occur in this area at this time of year? <clears throat> we use latitude and longitude and week number. So with these criteria for this period, you know, we've got, uh, on, on, for, for, on, in total, we had 430,000 records, but we've reduced increase the confidence and the probability so we've reduced the number of records so we've got we've still got 272,000 records of which unsurprisingly chiff chaffs were by far the most common this is so this is a count of the times the birds have called this is not a measure of abundance um which i know is important to, for many ecological surveys and we'll touch on that a bit a bit later um oyster catches obviously some sites next to the to the uh, on the harbor um but this is the kind of distribution that we're getting uh, I'll go and take a lot more stuff in a second, but the one thing, the kind of baseline data we get is the count by by species. So here are the six recorders. Um, we've got, I'm, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but we see massive site preferences. Some species you'd expect to see a, a very strong site preference, like uh, green shank next to, next to the, the, um, the water, as you might, 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 be, uh, might be expecting. Obviously, red shank again, right next to where the water is. But again, we're getting species distributions, which is a bit unusual. Well, I wasn't expecting, but we see this in other sites like Chiff Chaff. Um, you know, we're getting 1,600 calls on one part of a site and 37,000 on another. We see this time and time again on sites which are far more uh, more consistent in their in their in their habitat. Uh, you may have some, you know, uh, scrub or some some uh, some regenerating woodland. But you'll find massive preference where some species um, inhabit. You know, this may be driven just by the fact that happen to be on the edge of two territories or something. But things like bullfinch and chaffinch and and chiff chaff, massive preference where you think there might be a, a fairly um, consistent um, presence of some of these species. Um, so this is just to give you a flavour. This is the kind of the, the species list that we got. Um, uh, Skylark again, very, very specific site they were they were found on. We find Skylark are particularly interesting. On one site, we had quite a number of recorders in Norfolk, and the the the, the Skylarks were predominantly on one part of the site, um, which caused some concern because it, it, it transpires it could be a fairly fragile population of Skylarks, um, and so they're looking at the sites adjacent to it. To see, can we make them more more skylark friendly? So perhaps to encourage them to to spread across the site. Um, there's probably a couple, <clears throat> a couple of examples here of of, um, of false positives. I think there's one uh, coming up. Uh, I think oh no, it's not. Uh, we get one of the false positives. We get a, a short-toed tree creeper. We've done a lot of validation on this, um, and short-toed tree creeper is a pretty unusual bird. In the UK, and by listening to the calls, and we've had we've had some really good uh, ornithologists listen to the calls. They, th they think it's a dunnock, which is nowhere near as exciting. Um, and we get other um, other false positives. We get um, hawfinch confused with a robin, uh, and and so that we're doing things to fix these. I mean, the reason that robin gets confused with it, or hawfinch gets confused with a robin, if you go into Zeno Canto or whatever and listen to a hawfinch call. It sounds just like part of a phrase within a robin call. 
And again, this is one of the limitations of machine learning is you sample it for three seconds. And if it sounds like a Hawfinch, it'll tell you it's a Hawfinch. But in, in, in the larger context, which machine learning doesn't have, is what's adjacent to that record? So was it a Robin calling before and a Robin calling after, afterwards? So machine learning in itself can't fix that problem. Um, so we're looking at a deep learning layer, which will learn from this and then uh, uh, improve the quality of the machine learning generated data. It's very hard to improve some of the machine learning algorithms themselves because the calls are just simply so, so similar. Um, a friend of mine played me a call. He said, yeah, listen to this, what is it? Um, I thought it's a night jar. And he says, nope, it's a mole cricket. Um, so we're getting some quite spurious things. And of course, there's, there's all the issues around um, uh, imperson you know, people impersonating uh, birds, uh, um, impersonating other birds. But just go through this quite quickly. We can get, we can, because we've got in this data set, you know, 250,000 records, we can look at midnight to midnight, what's calling when, um, when the wren's calling. This is, there's a lot of data in this one. So we, we get a lot of stuff that uh, can't be resolved in this graph, but you can see the, the patterns day by day. What are we seeing? Um, chiff chaff says you would expect to be chiff chaffing away. We get lots of goldfinches, perhaps more, more vibrant, uh, more variable. Um, this graph is is this is one of our standard graphs about midnight to midnight by month. Now we've only got a subset of data, so this is not a great representation. But when you're getting long term data sets, you can see how spring chorus starts earlier as, as uh, dawn chorus starts earlier as, as spring arrives, and and then dawn chorus, uh, dusk chorus moves out, and the call rates vary. Um, and and the last thing I'll sh I'll show you in this particular example is 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 species richness. Now here are the six recorders from from Arm. Um, uh, on one, it was on a it's what's called a clay pit. So it's on a site which is uh, it's got lots of water next to it. So you have quite a big expanse of water, and it is literally an old clay pit, and it's got some uh, oak woodland at the back of it. So we've had higher species richness consistently across the, the site, as you might expect. The other extreme, we've got on five. On five was um, this uh, coniferous plantation, quite dank, quite quite dark. Um, although the thing that kind of Change the data that we were recording was there was an old bomb crater right next to where the recorder was placed, and that there was quite there was quite a big big pond there. So we had, we we're picking up a few few of the water bird species, wading species, uh, well, uh, like rails and things. But that habitat, we were, were consistently picking up goshawk, firecrest, all these really woodland but good woodland birds. Um, and now over time, as you can start to use species richness as a measure, even though there are limitations as to what species we might be picking up. If you start measuring it on a monthly or weekly or an annual basis, and you can start to look at trends, you can see is your species richness getting better and better. We can also look at other data in other ways. And this is, I'm going to stop this in a second. Um, this is farmland bird index. Um, this is farmland bird index. Uh, farmland bird index, uh, as many of you know, is defined by, uh, I think it's 14 species, um, these birds here. And we can track the index. This is on a daily basis. It wouldn't make sense to do it on a daily basis. It's just so the, the example. But you can see here, for example, um, when the skylarks kick off, they, they 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 kick off. We see this time and time again. They kick off right at the end of March, uh, in February, so into, um, into into March. And you can see this massive increase. And you see the same with some of the migrating birds as well, when the white throats arrive and the cuckoos arrive. And just on that point, the last thing I'll show you as a, as a, as a demo, you can get into individual species or groups of species if you wish uh, to understand their, their site distribution. This overall data set, by the way, has got a lot of non-UK projects within it from North and South America and other countries. Um, so when I click on select species, these have not been recorded at all. This is from a broader data set, but if you were using the data set yourselves, you'd only see the birds that you see on your sites. So we don't get these in uh, in in, in Arn. <laughs> um, but if I look just very quickly at cuckoo, for example, um, uh, so we see here we've got if I reduce the detection confidence. It's quite a quite a. Um, so we've got a thousand records of cuckoo, and you can see when it's calling, it's calling. You know, start calling at dawn, and come mid morning, the call rate's declining. So. An example is if you're doing a survey, if you're if you're doing a site survey and you want to look at you're looking for cuckoo, then being on site before ten o'clock or nine o'clock is is going to be really important to pick these species up. Um, we see other sites where cuckoo show a massive preference to certain parts of a site. Um, 
where they're calling from consistently. Um, so as I said, there's many different ways you can see when, when they start calling. There's maybe some, some new birds have just arrived on site on about the 12th of May or whatever. Um, and we see all kinds of behaviors. We saw Chetty's warbler, a massive spike at three and four o'clock in the morning in April and May. Now Chetty's warbler is a quite distinctive species anyway to, 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 um, to identify. But if you were wanting to, to, to understand a species like that, then you maybe have to go at three or four o'clock in the morning to, uh, to find it. Anyway, I'm going back to my slides now. So the slides, um, this is just a summary of what I've already shown you. So I'm, I'm not going to go through this again, um, following the bird index. I wanted to explore a couple, a couple of things about what's um, what the strengths and weaknesses of site surveys are and uh, a bioacoustic surveying. They, I'll make it really clear that both got strengths and they both got weaknesses. Um, so this is really a spot alert. This is really a tool to extend the work of ecologists. It's not to replace the work of ecologists. So this is a presentation I gave with Atkins Realis, with one of their uh, senior ecologists, Ken Lipscomb, at the uh, CIM AGM last year. Um, and this is important to kind of dig into some of these things, like um, surveyor experience, bias, and ability. Um, one thing I found, I do breeding bird surveys myself, uh, in the Quantox. Um, getting consistent uh, species identification can be quite challenging. There's uh, some anecdotal stories I've heard about projects in Costa Rica where the surveyor or the, the, the ecologist on site changes and they get a different um, different uh, species count. Uh, that's an obvious thing. We've seen examples where someone's going through the validation of, of the calls um, as a junior ecologist and, say, rejecting a number of records, saying that it wasn't a lapwing or it wasn't a, a whatever it might be. And the senior ecologist said, nope, they're actually correct because these are flight calls or, or alarm calls or whatever. So that level of experience is really um, kind of a major impact on, on the quality of the survey, uh, especially if you're getting surveyors, uh, ecologists with, of different skill sets going on site at different times. Um, and, you know, I was talking to Kate earlier about, you know, work-life balance and and uh, you're doing bat surveys can be incredibly challenging from a um a family perspective um and there's cost as well um you know we, we can run this for a few hundred pounds a year um for, for a uh, per recorder it's just not physically possible to do that with with an on-site ecologist so and, and we can run run these these things 24 7. um access restrictions can be important uh you know some sites which could be say deep marsh or sites where there's particularly uh, challenging species that might be disrupted, like cranes, for example, or site access is really prob problematic, like um, rail side. Um, these recorders can go in there and, and do that. Now, disturbances is a, is a really interesting one. I saw a fascinating project, I think it was on black grouse, which showed that when the surveyors were on site, or the ecology were on site, um, watching the, the lecking taking place, the, the, the lecking groups, the call rate dropped significantly, and it was impacted for a few hours. So the fact that the fact there's somebody similar there, yeah, someone physically present on site, caused um, a, a big change in behaviour. And you'll see that as you're going through woodland, the birds go quiet, and some of them start to move away. So the physical presence can can um, can, can can impact that. Um, and it's really good to, if there's if there's not much surveying being done before. We'll typically find maybe twenty percent more species than the that the on sites ecologists will find but equally and i think kate's going to touch on this the, the on-site ecologist will find stuff that doesn't vocalize much um and so the two together can be really compelling uh, the other side of the coin is um what are the limitations um species not vocalizing not detected um so uh, an ornithologist can pick that up um as i mentioned earlier we don't we don't um we can't quantify abundance um, I know abundance is a really important measure for a, a site restoration or a survey, or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this, what we're doing to try and fix that in a moment. Um, yeah, this, this, the, the recorder sense of capability, uh, it, the, most recorders will pick up what you can hear. Um, so within, say, 50 meters, it, it's changed, affected by the wind direction and background noise. Um, but obviously, you can pick up things. If you've got a spotting scope, you'll find stuff. Um, that you'll never see. Uh, I should say, Stephen and I went and saw Sab Sabine's goal last week. Was it Stephen? Um, which we'd, we'd never have picked up by by sound. It was um, 
very very it's very, um, very quiet. Yeah, indeed. Um, and and the high levels of background noise. Now, I think Kate's going to touch on this in a very industrialized site. Um, we can get interference from especially low low frequency sound uh, from machines, which can mask some species in different ways, um, which can create a bias in itself. Um, so to, to, so to think about things, you know, what, what considerations should you be thinking about? Um, what we do is probability-based, um, false positives and false negatives. False no positives are far easier. I mentioned um, Hawfinch and uh, uh, Robin, and there's a few other pairs uh, uh, that we get consistently confused by. Um, there's things that we had, a, a, for example, we, had, we picked up records of corncrake. Um, I got really excited about this. And we go and listen to the sounds, and it's and, it, and this is a, a site where there's a big electricity pile running through the site, and I think there's about three or four of us who listen to this, and we all think it's actually water, rain hitting the electricity pylons. This is crackling noise. So I can understand why it got confused, um, but I, I don't think it was right. Uh, equally, we find species uh, that the people on the site didn't didn't even know was present in the Somerset levels. We started picking at black crown night heron. Black crown night heron, had, I think the only breeding record was 2017 at Ham Wall, the RSPB site. This site was a couple of kilometers away. And we started picking it up regularly. And, and the herons are quite hard to, to differentiate. So we weren't quite convinced. But then I had a call one morning at five or well, six o'clock in the morning from Joe saying, We've just seen one right next to one of the recorders. Um, so that was great validation. But we've also had Hooper on this site. Um, no one saw it, but the calls were very distinctive, and um, uh, and one was seen the day before, about a kilometre away. So there's, there's good evidence it was correct, and, we, and things like spotted flycatcher, which should be a bit more cryptic. Um, accuracy of the models I already touched on. You know, we we, we under record. I think starling um, quality of the audio. Um, at one level, we don't mind which recorders people use. We we'll work with audio moths or, or obviously uh, one of acoustic devices. But again, the quality of the recording right is really important. How the how the devices are configured, especially you know to, to CD quality, sort of forty eight kilohertz. Survey design is really important. Um, uh, you know, we make sure you have the coverage of the right parts of the site. Maybe have a control site where, you, where the part of the site's not changing, so you're using that as a control to see uh, what 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 impact you're having elsewhere on the site to try and remove some of the variables such as climate. Abundance is, is gets, gets brought up pretty regularly, um, understandably. Uh, we've, we've just finished the first part of a research project with uh, funded by Natural England on using triangulation. So having three recorders about two metres apart and uh, identifying which direction and distance the calls come from and then being able to sort of join the dots saying, well, we had 100 blackbird calls and 75 of them from the northwest and 25 from the southeast. Therefore, we, we think, if we map it out, we've got two territories. Therefore, we've got uh, four birds, um, as opposed to not knowing if 100 blackbird calls were from 100 blackbirds or one blackbird. Um, and it's this topic we'll be working on over the winter. Um, yeah, other other um, data sets kind of complement this, bring value. We can bring value to other data sets. Um, climate data can be really important. Uh, we see daily frequency changes in, in call rates. On some sites, we've got really good wet, uh, rainfall pattern and even UV patterns. Um, and overlaying that data can help inform um, why the, the uh, call rates varying enormously. Um, other data sets, uh, and this one, I've got different characteristics of auditability, costs, accuracy. Um, but ultimately, I think we're, we're really about simplifying complexity, making it really easy for anybody as an ecologist or, or a, a citizen scientist or a landowner, a farmer, just to upload the data and get, get the results out in a very coherent way. So my final slide um, is sort of conclusions before I hand over to, to, to Kate is, you know, we can generate pretty accurate large scale species level data sets at a very moderate cost. Um, it's not perfect, but it's it's consistently imperfect. And, and what I mean by that is, yeah, we, we might under-record starlings or we might, we might misrepresent uh, hawfinch, but we're doing it consistently over time. So you get a like-for-like -like comparison over, over a period of years, potentially. And and, and we keep all the audio with, with the customer's permission. Um, so in two, two or three years' time, we, we, we have better ways of analyzing the sound. We can go back and reprocess it all. Um, 
the false positives, um, negatives, and validation needs to be considered. You know, we're exploring um, rare bird finders, for example, where validation will be really important. And any particular uh, key species that you get, less a spotted woodpecker or woodcock or whatever, we'd always encourage you to, to go and validate the records. We haven't got into that yet uh, in, in today. Um, significant supplement to site surveys. We see this time again where people want, want both short-term surveys, let's get the baseline in before a project starts, but we want to monitor it over the course of two, three, four years. Um, and we want to do it consistently. So the significant savings to be to be made. Atkins last year spoke about how they're changing their, their methodology from doing, say, six site surveys as part of a project to doing three site surveys and leaving the recorders out um, for the whole time. So they get the balance between some ground truthing and getting you know, pretty large scale data sets. Um, this will still need interpreta interpretation um, and understanding the context of the site. Um, the machine learning AI isn't intelligent enough to recognize there's something spurious going on. Uh, it does need that absolutely key interpretation of the data uh, so your clients or, or your land managers can understand this. But one thing we found time and time again, volunteers really get, get, get stuck into this. It's You've got people who, one site volunteer with one of the wildlife trusts goes out at six o'clock every Sunday morning. It's been really good for his his mental health. He's he, he, even at 6 a.m. in the winter, he's going out and it's dark. Um, he thoroughly enjoys it. it, it you know, it, he's he's fantastic. Um, and then getting involved with it with the validation. You know, we've got one one uh, volunteer for the, the Wildlife Trust. He's, he, I send, you know, he gets access to say a hundred or five hundred recordings of different species, and he'll go through and he'll listen to them. He says, "I much prefer doing this than watching Strictly Come Dancing with my wife." So um, he, he thoroughly enjoys that. So um, that's my last slide. Um, I'm going to open up to questions.